Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger, and this podcast has been nominated for Two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award, as well as Welp Magazine, just listing us, me, <laughs> and Dare to Dream is one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. I'm super grateful for that acknowledgement. I've been doing this a really long time, and I still find that I'm curious. And because today, the new curiosity is about time. What if you could change time so that it worked for you? What if you could actually control time? That is what my guest expert is going to be speaking about, and we'll be talking about her new book, All the Time in the World. I want to also start out by saying thank you to my sponsors, Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. They do fantastic energy work out in the world, and you can become a facilitator. You can take a class. You can get involved anywhere, any country. Go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R.com, or Access Consciousness. Com. I am a book writing coach. I also take books to a guaranteed international bestseller. I have a couple of folks in my book in my book writing group who just graduated, so to speak. They successfully published their books out into the world. And so we have a few hot, rare spots that are opening. If you want to write your book, you want to work with me live, coaching you to get your book done this year, it is more than possible you can write a highly engaging book. You can grab one of those spots. It's at debbiedashinger.com slash visible visionaries. It's D-E-B-B-I, D as in David, A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash visible visionaries to become one of those writers. All you have to do is come on board. I take care of the rest. So indeed, this episode features how time works so you can control time for yourself. My guest is Lisa Broderick who earned a BA from Stanford University and an MBA from Duke. She is a transcendental meditation siddha, attended the Monroe Institute for the exploration of expanded states of consciousness and studied imagery and dream reading at the American Institute for Mental Imagery with noted author and teacher of Western spirituality, Dr. Gerald Epstein for 15 years. Lisa currently runs a business consultancy based in New York City that helps socially conscious entrepreneurs manifest their creativity and energy. If you'd like to learn more about her and her new book, go to allthetimebook.com. And I'm just going to flash this gorgeous book here. This is also something I discussed in my class yesterday because there were a few pieces of the magnificence of what Lisa created as an author and as an expert that I wanted my students to see. So her book, Amazing Read, and welcome, Lisa, to Dare to Dream. It's so great to have you. Debbie, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, this is amazing that we are here. And I just want to start out with my congratulations to you, because this book, which doesn't yet and will at some point have a symbol here, your book just went international bestseller hit the highest rankings in Australia, in Denmark, in the UK, in Canada, in Italy, and the USA, both Kindle and hardcover. Awesome, congratulations. How does that feel after birthing this baby book out into the world? <laughs> Somehow it seems like manipulating time is more real to me than that but I think I'll get used to it. It is a wonderful thing that people are finding it useful and valuable. And I really want people to lead their best possible lives. That's what it's all about. And that's why I wrote the book. So how do we make time our friend? How do we connect with time in that way to even have a relationship with it? Well, the first thing to think about time, and that is uh, people think that they're a slave to time. They think that time is an arrow. We think about that, which is flying through the air, through space, and the tail of the arrow, the feathers is the past, and the tip is the future, and the direction of it, and the speed of it, no one can change. We're just riding along for it. But that's actually not true, because the how we perceive time is affected by how much we focus and what we focus on. That's why I coined a term called focused perception. When we use a particular type of focus, we can actually change time for ourselves. And by the way, Debbie, we can change time on the clock. That's in the book too. So it's not just that we can change time with our minds, although our minds are tremendously powerful. 
but the book contains a tremendous amount of science to prove that time is not what we think. It's not. And if you know it's not what we think, then it, it's controllable by us. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up because your book does go deeply into this focus perception. It's actually the basis for many other exercises to come. And you talk about focus perception as being the key to manipulating one's construct of time. So what kind of practice is focused perception? Well, that's a little bit like meditation and I'm a meditator for 30 years. As you mentioned, I am a transcendental meditation meditator, meditator as well as a siddha, which is advanced meditation training. And in meditation, of course, one learns to tune out other things to the exception of all others. And so you may focus on your breath, you may focus on a mantra, but you're basically uh, focusing on one thing to the exclusion of others and it focuses the mind. So when I became a meditator, I started to notice that time acted funny. I'd be meditating and then I would think that a minute had passed and I'd look up and it would be an hour and I was still sitting upright, which really surprised me. And I had not fallen asleep, but I was somewhere else. So what was it about time? So the first thing to know about focus perception is that it's meditative, very hard to do when you're frenetic and running around and worried and fearful. We'll talk about fear. But if you can sit yourself down in a meditative way and focus your mind using the exercises in the book and this one in particular, then you can do a lot of things, not the least of which is control the passage of time. That's beautiful. You know, when I did, and by the way, full disclosure, I did every single exercise in the book. <laughs> you did. How were they for you? <laughs> amazing. And I had some favorites that I'm going to go back and use. And just this idea of focus perception that you offer to us, I've never done anything like that. And Lord knows I've done enough meditating TM and, and many other imagery kind of hypnosis and so forth. But the way you have us count ourselves down something really interesting happens. And I will say what I love about it is it's super fast. My God, it's very fast, speaking of time, to get us there. And then there's an opening for something else to occur. Was yes. that your purpose in creating that? It was. And the counting down actually comes from training, which I studied with Dr. Jerry Epstein in Kabbalah. And so it was, a, it was a technique and a methodology. And Dr. Jerry would talk about it going into the time of no time. Because when you count down from let's say three and you're counting backwards while doing in particular breathing exercises, which are all based in science and biology, you get to a place where you're not only focusing the mind but you've relaxed the body, but it's a signal to you that you've gone back somewhere. Where have you gone? You've gone to a time of zero, no time, the now. And when you're sitting in the now, as most spiritual traditions would suggest, that is the time of manifestation. It's the place where genius lives. It's the place where miracles happen. We're able to do it just by, I've done it in ladies' rooms, in parked cars, in, on buses and trains, everywhere you could imagine to focus my mind, to get to this place where not only am I centered and I'm focusing on one thing to the exclusion of others, but I can create the life I want. And in that way, I can also manipulate time. You talked earlier and mentioned that we can control time on the clock. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, what popped for me when you said that is, what about age? How does that reflect on age? People have a sense, right? Every second that goes by, you just aged again, you're getting closer to death. How does manipulating or being able to control time reflect on age? And how do you feel about it? How do you feel about age in regards to time? So what I learned when I started to study this after beginning, after meditating and having ex experiences with time my whole life, since I was a little girl, I've had experiences with slowed down time in particular. I realized that time in one sense only exists because things move around. No movement, no time. If the earth didn't move, we wouldn't be calculating days by 24 hours. If you were in a dark room, not moving at all, no perception, no time. So if the entire universe were not moving anywhere, there'd be no time, which means that time is rooted in the physical to some extent, but it's also rooted in perception. And the perception is, as Einstein famously said, when you're sitting with a pretty girl, an hour seems like a minute. And when your hand's on a hot stove, a minute seems like an hour. Why? <laughs> because of what you're focusing on. That's the secret. And so, and also Einstein, of course, believed that time was an illusion. 
and that relativity showed that time is relative. So if time is one part physical and one part perception, let's change the part of the equation we control, which is our perception. And the thing I do when dealing with, a, with things that are physical realities is I remove fear. Fear rings like the clearest bell above us. If we think of manifestation and even of quantum physics collapsing the wave function, what you're thinking about, how you show up for a situation, affects the situation, the physical nature of the situation. If you show up afraid, that's what you're going to get. So these exercises completely remove fear. And in fact, if you have time for one later, we could actually do one uh, on the radio, which might be fun. And completely remove fear so that the fear of aging, what you focus on, as has been famously said, grows in your life. Focus on other things right? Use the exercises in the book to focus on the life that you want to live. Does the physical aspect of time exist in is real? Sure, of course it is. I think of it as a quantum ballet. We're doing our, we're each doing our thing. It's a giant ballet. It's wonderful and messy and chaotic and choreographed all at the same time. I want what I want and you want what you want and physical things move forward, but miracles happen. And what we focus on grows in our lives. So use the part we can focus on, including to focus on things, again, to lead our best possible lives. Great, great. Who doesn't want a miracle? And yes, we are going to make time for that exercise. So folks, don't go away. Okay. You alluded to the fact, since you were a little girl, you've had these experiences. So I know something very traumatic happened. And that's what opened you up to years of research in this realm becoming who you are today. So do you mind just to let the audience in on what did occur? What was this big turning point for you when you were a young girl? Thank you for asking. And very often we have ex formative experiences before about the age of seven, something might happen. For me, what happened is my parents were New Yorkers, but we lived in Arizona. And Arizona in the 60s was the seat of a, a new industry called the computer industry. And my dad was a computer scientist early on. Anyway, we were at a cabin in the mountains when I was four and little girls and full of life, my sister and I, she's a year younger, jumping on a bed in a cabin in a remote part of Arizona and the bed rolled away. We didn't realize it was on coasters mm -hmm. and I flew through the room and was impaled on a plate glass window, which I broke with my head. So there I was on the windowsill, half in, half out in a remote part in Arizona, bleeding out. And I had a classic death experience. And the death was, death experience was, I remember most of it. I could draw it. I remember the station wagon and even the glass and the, uh, the country facility where I was cared for. I did live, obviously. And from above, which I saw as though I were hovering over myself. And then suddenly I was in my body again. But I never went back to the way it was. At least I don't think so. Now, in all fairness, memories are strange things. We can remember something vividly and another person remembers another thing. But my memory of all of that was suddenly the world was alive. Everything was talking and different and more vibrant. And that's actually very common with death experiences, that people come back and they report these things. But one thing I noticed was I had a superpower. And the superpower was I could slow down time. I could, I'd be running on a field or doing track or any of the other things that little girls do in grade school, and suddenly the field would change. We now know today it's common with Michael Jordan and all of the athletes, they're even trained to do it. They're trained to slow down the field. Is this well, was, called being in the zone or is there is, another word? It is, there are many words for it. There's a flow state, there's being in the zone, right? The now, in the present, in spirituality, it's all the same thing. It's a brainwave state, which I cover in the book, which when these brainwaves converge, triggered by, I believe, focused perception, which is why I include that in the book, you can move into a state of flow, zone, the now, this time of no time, where time slows down, and you can do things that you want to do. So while bowling at the age of eight, I bowled a nearly perfect game, I was, I'm still exasperated. I remember trying to mess up by throwing the ball in a different lane, and it still wouldn't go in the same lane, and I still bowled a strike. Now that's a zone for a little girl. But it never left me, even though I didn't tell anyone at the time, because I thought they would think I was weird or crazy. But when I became a meditator in my 20s, I realized something was up. And then I started a study of ancient spiritual traditions all over the world, from Buddhism and Zen Buddhism and Chinese and Kabbalah and India. And then later on, about 10 years later, I discovered quantum mechanics. And I realized that the state that we're reaching may be the same state described by the most modern physics. 
as the quantum world. So this state we're reaching, are you referring back to that zone, that place where all stands still and all is possible? Well, maybe more than that, we've all experienced these weird episodes, right, where something happens and we say to ourselves, did I really just see that? Did that really just happen? You may see something fall in slow motion. Now that I, the book has been out and I've been asking stories for, uh, for people for years, they, they abound from the glass falling in slow motion to a piece of wood co coming at a friend of mine at high speed on a highway. And in slow motion, he swerved out of the way and only took off the top of the, top of the car and didn't kill him. So we have all of these experiences, but we mostly pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off and go on like nothing happened which is why I think the, the issue has not been explored more. I didn't do that. I started writing them down and noticing them and wondering what I could do to bring them on. And it's this state of focused perception that I talk about in the book. Mm -hmm. And managing and controlling our time. Is there a place in there where it allows us to deal with old wounds and trauma? Is there a way we can use it to heal? There is, and that's a very important part of this work. If, we are, if we're stuck in the past, or afraid of the future, we can't be in the now, right? It's that simple. And so I actually say that all transformation, it, personal transformation work is rooted in time where we need to free ourselves from the past and not be afraid of the future and come into the now where we can manifest a life that we want. If you were living right in the present moment, there's no disease there. In this moment, right now, where, you're, where everything is, and in, in, uh, in Hebrew, the word for peace means nothing missing, missing, nothing lost, nothing broken, right? Shalom. Mm -hmm. And so that's a place of peace. That's the now. Nothing missing, nothing lost, nothing broken. If we can get there and not be afraid of the past, then we can actually heal ourselves. And the book, actually, the book has an exercise to heal traumas from the past and has some stories of real world stories of huge trauma. Young people who, a, a young man who was a bartender who served a drink to someone who died on the road. And another woman who, uh, who was harmed by an adult as a child. And so these stories require tremendous courage to even tell and then begin to overcome. But if we can relive them in a way from a third party perspective as an adult, looking back at our lives, and begin to heal ourselves using some of the practices in the book, we can move from the past, being stuck in the past and move into the now. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier when you were telling the story about yourself as a child, you mentioned bowling and when you were running on the field. So there's an allusion in the book to using this method and what you teach in regards to exercise. So I do wanna say for anyone out there who loves to exercise or is an athlete, can you tell them how they might positively manipulate time towards exercise and becoming an excellent athlete? Well, an athlete or just a regular person, one of the exercises, in fact, we could do it right now. If we wanted to do a quick exercise, we could cover that. Absolutely. And it wouldn't necessarily uh, pertain to, to um, exercise in particular, but it pertains to anything that we want to have happen in our lives that's fulfilling. That's what's important. So we're gonna pick something fulfilling. So right now I will say, and we can talk about this later on, I work in public safety as well. I run a, a, cha a charity that's in police reform. So if you are driving, do not do this. <laughs> do not attempt this while driving. Go home. You can listen later on my website, lisabroderick.com is this exercise. You can download it and listen at another time. But for everyone else, for a quick exercise, we're going to begin to relax. And so if you're sitting in a chair, that's a good place to be. And the two poses to sit in the chair would be feet on the floor with a straight back and then arms on your thighs like King Tut. It's a straight arm, straight leg energy posture, which is common to Kabbalah and also to China. Now there's also the lotus position for people who like that. Very powerful, a little different, and that's from India. Either work but you don't want randomly cross things. You wanna have yourself uh, aligned either in one or the other, it would be helpful. So sit comfortably in one of those poses and slowly close your eyes. Uh, now we're gonna have an intention to relax. And in doing that, we're gonna use a little biology. Let's inhale through our nose and exhale through our mouths, a long, slow exhalation through the mouth, twice as long as the inhale, think about that. Inhale through your nose, a regular inhalation, but exhaling long and slow, even seeing the air coming out of your mouth as smoke. 
And with the next inhalation, let's see the number three in our mind's eye. Any way we see it is perfect for us. You may not think that you can visualize, of course you can daydream. Any way that's perfect for you. And breathing in through our nose and exhaling out through our mouth, see the three dissolve into the number two. And in through our nose and out through our mouth, a long, slow exhalation, two dissolves into the number one. In through our nose and out through our mouths, the number one dissolves into the number zero. We're now in the time of no time, the now. I'm gonna sit quietly for a moment. And now a special trait, bring to mind something that you would really like to create for yourself. Something satisfying and fulfilling, something wonderful. It could be mundane, like a check coming, or you finding the right apartment or getting a promotion. It could be world changing. I wish for world peace and for American police and communities to get along, but live it as a movie. Live it as a visceral movie where you see, feel, hear, sense, and know this is all happening, this wonderful experience. You're living this in every sense. And now for a little vig, let's, let's amp it up a little bit. Imagine how this is a benefit to everyone. This is not for you. It's a benefit for everyone involved. Think about how many people this would benefit. And the reason we do this is now we're not afraid it won't happen for us. We just want it for someone else, whatever this is. It's wonderful, satisfying and fulfilling and for benefit for everyone involved. Keep this thought in mind and live it experientially as much as a movie. And now become aware that it's already happened. It's done. It's complete. It's accomplished. Imagine how you are, how relieved you are, how joyous you are. You're living the moment where you learned the check came, the job came through, the apartment is yours, the house is yours. Some miracle that you want to have happen and you're actually living it. It's accomplished fully and completely. There is nothing more to do. Now our brains, our fabulous computers may take over and try to explain why and how. It doesn't matter who, what, when, where, why, how. Just forget all of that. Don't care about the details. Live the experience that it's done. It's happened. It's complete. Now let's take this into our bodies and we'll amplify this going out to the bottom of your feet into the earth as though the energy is filling up every cell of the earth. It's filling it up, the giant earth. You and the earth are attached and this energy is going right into the earth from your feet and filling the entire earth. So the whole earth is this experience that it's already happened. And now coming back from the earth into your body, going up, 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 it goes out through the top of your head in every direction, higher and higher through the building you're in and into the solar system and into the galaxy and the universe and higher, 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 higher. And now just let it go. Feel your body resting in the calmness of nothing more to do. It's done, it's complete. And when we're ready, we can slowly open our eyes. I'm back. <laughs> Isn't that fun? <laughs> now, what has just happened here? So if manipulating time and controlling it for our lives is one part perception and one part physical world, the perception part we control, when we are faced with that moment, because we want this to happen for our lives, how we show up for that moment is now forever different. In the back of your mind somewhere, you have lived the experience that it's done, it's happened, it's complete. So what else have you done? You've removed the fear that it won't happen. You've also have a little vig again with the universe because the universe is going, oh, really? Well, if it's for everybody, then I'm really interested in supporting this dream. So let's take it even higher, right? And then we bring in the quantum mix. And that is, we don't know whether and how what we do affects every moment of our physical life, but we do know that it's a principle in quantum mechanics that it does observation and the observer affect the collapse of the wave function from a wave into a particle, right? Essentially into matter. So how we show up, if that's true for us in our lives, and it's hard to imagine that it's not, we're different too, and even in the quantum field. Now we don't know how this works yet. We don't know the quantum, how, how the quantum world is bubbling up into our big everyday world. Some believe it cannot, although science is increasingly pointing to the fact that it's here including really far out principles like quantum entanglement, which we can talk about. But if all that is true and we've just changed how we show up and we remove fear, 
you have set the stage to not waste any time about having this wonderful thing happen for you. Mm. And if you're not wasting time, you're controlling time. That same experience could be used to actually control clock time, which is in the book, which we won't do now. You can do that quietly at home. But it's the same principle where what we focus on affects our perception of time. And we've just used it to lead our best possible life. What exercise do you use the most? Is it, um, is it called Mind Your Today? <laughs> yeah, Mind Your Today. There are three things that I do. And I do have a bit of an unusual nightlife, let's say. It is more akin to an Eastern tradition. And it's really only more recently in Western civilization that humans sleep through the night. They didn't really used to do that. I mean, for all kinds of reasons, there were predators out there and it wasn't warm and it wasn't warm enough. It wasn't cold enough, whatever. So I sleep from about 10 or 11 to about 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. And studying at the Monroe, Monroe Institute, about three and a half hours after sleeping is an ideal time to do some very special things. So around three o'clock in the morning, I do this exercise. And in the day, I actually think of the things that I want to dream from my heart's desire. I actually say that. What is my heart's desire? My heart desire was this conversation is wonderful with you, Debbie. Mm -hmm. That was one of it. I have a presentation after this that's important to me, and that's wonderful. My heart's desire was the book would, would help people. My heart's desire could be that the check comes or arrives or whatever it is. I pick things out, you know, three, four, five, or six, and I do that exercise for each of them individually. Again, on my website, lisabroderick.com is this exercise, which you can download as an audio file and put on something in your bed where you can listen to it at three o'clock in the morning. That is a friendly hint because that is the time of the prophets. That is the time of the mystics. Specifically 3 a.m. wherever we are or having well, much sleep and then doing it. Well, so it's, it's a little, it's three or three and a half hours after sleep, right? With that said, in, in most ancient cultures, so uh, 3 a.m. is the time of the void in Buddhism. Between three and five is the time of the prophets in Kabbalah. So mm -hmm. there's something about the middle of the night, right? That is, uh, even if you, if you go to sleep in the daytime and you wake up three hours, it's not going to be the same as 3 a.m. local time. Where there's a special, seems to be a special energy mm -hmm. that goes throughout most ancient cultures. So you could do that, put it on a device that does not ring. I have an MP3 player. And also I have a little, I have something called a totem. A totem is something to remind me to do something like a totem pole and it's a crystal. So I have a crystal in bed with me and inevitably I'll roll over on it and I'll think to myself, okay, great. Now time to do, now it's a time for me. I'm going to do my, my imagery exercise. I'm going to do my guided meditation. And I do that exact meditation for each of the things that I want with my heart's desire. So I do that at 3 a.m. And if you fall asleep, good. Because in essence, there's two of us, right? There's, there's your lower self, your little I, your personality self running around and feeling harm and unhappy and coping with the world and strategizing and planning. And then there's, there's your big I, right? Your higher self, which is more godlike, more spiritual, more akin to the creation, the creator. And so at three o'clock in the morning, there's no little eye floating around wondering what you're going to do right now. You've forgotten all of that, but your big eye could take this information and go, oh, really? Well, I've just heard that Debbie wants this and I am going to do this. I'm going to work on that. So if you do this and fall asleep, it's ideal. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. Fall asleep even while you're doing it. Don't even remember. You'll know what you've done. And then when I wake up in the morning, I do something, which is what you mentioned. And that is I dream my entire day in advance. Before I get out of bed, before I turn off the light, I'm lying in bed and I think to myself, oh, this is my day. And like a, a movie that I'm watching on screen and I'm the only person in the theater, I see myself getting up and making a phone call and being in a presentation and being on this call mm -hmm. and having the check come and have, finding the apartment and my car starts and the tires come and I find a new life and a wonderful miracle happens. And I go through my day all the way to the very end and I get to the very end and I'm going to sleep and then I close my eyes. And I've just lived my day in advance, the perfect day. For all the same reasons that we just did this exercise, living that perfect day in advance has tremendous benefit for it turning out that way, mm. for saving time, for not wasting time, for speeding up time or slowing down time. Mm. If you need, if you have a really big proposal and you cannot imagine that you could possibly get it done, use that exercise to live the experience that it's done. It's finished. It's complete you will be very surprised that when you dive into that proposal, having removed all fear, it will be done and finished and complete. 
And I get phone calls all the time saying, Lisa, it worked. <laughs> I'll bet you do. I bet your clients love you. These are really hot <laughs> tips. And it's not hard, folks. I can tell you because doing the exercises and I took a couple every day, it I was amazed at how quick it was, but how transformative. And how's it getting any better? When we master time, we master ourselves. That's really it. Personal transformation is rooted in time. Manifestation is rooted in time. Why? Because what you want to have happen hasn't happened yet. So let's deal with time, right? Mm -hmm. Let's deal with the one thing. I heard a, I, when I told my near-death experience, I heard someone say, it's like all of death, all of life is a near-death experience, uh -huh. right? And so we're clinging to time and time is the thing we know the least about. It's the biggest problem in physics. It's the biggest problem in everybody's lives. Mm -hmm. And especially after COVID, so before COVID, this book was written before, during, and then of course it's after, we're getting to the end. And so people would picture their day as dollars, right? And so being busy was a badge of honor. Oh, I'm so busy. Yeah. I'm so scheduled. I'm so this, I'm so that, yes. and be so stressed out. And then what happened? Everything stopped. We stopped, it stopped, that stopped. And people right now are stressed out, burned out, bummed out, overwhelmed, and hopeless for a couple of reasons, if they feel that way, it may be because they've lost their connection to time. They don't have the routine that used to define them. So everyone out there, before you get back to business as usual, take control of your life. Take control of time, not your schedule, time. Sit down and create your day, live your day, live these things in advance so that you won't go back to being a slave to time any longer. Mm. You mentioned earlier that would I ask, you would go deeper into it. So I'm going to ask quantum entanglement. <laughs> Talk more about that. And by the way, I just want to preface this by saying your education, your brain on crack, I got to say it, your brain on crack, you got a brain lady. <laughs> so much beautiful science in here and your understanding of that science and your way to break it down for the lay person so we can understand what you're talking about. A lot of these words we've heard before that you know we may get snippets of that. So yes, let's talk about quantum entanglement. Well, first of all, say uh, the one of the fathers of quantum physics, Richard Feynman says, I can safely say no one understands quantum mechanics. So, you know, I did my best as a lay person to try to take these concepts of the latest science and help them be accessible. And so quantum entanglement, people have heard the phrase quantum mechanics. It's a field of, of point-like objects, particles. And when you observe things, different things happen. A lot of it, you know, it's, it's smaller than we could ever see. No one's ever seen a quanta, right? And so, but it's, and it's this entire field, but I'll tell you, quantum mechanics runs our lives. It's how we're having this phone call. It runs computers, it runs lasers. All aspects of our lives in terms of the latest technology are quantum-based. So we'll sit on that for a moment. But quantum entanglement is a, is a proven theory in quantum mechanics where, think about this for a moment, the implications. Let's say you have a, a, a particle of something, like a little piece of something, or maybe a, a tiny, tiny rock, and it's blue. And you have a blue rock, and you cut it in half, and there's two blue rocks, and you keep one with you, and you take the other blue rock to outer space. And you do something to the blue rock you have, and someone's looking at the blue rock in outer space, the exact same thing happens to the blue rock in outer space. Now, the blue rock is in outer space and the blue rock is, can, is not communicating with your rock, although it used to be part of your rock. It's called quantum entanglement. Let me and back up for one second so we can understand. Is this anything in the entire world universe that gets split in two that has these really mysterious properties? Or is there a reason why this particular blue rock that is here with us now, and the other piece half of that blue rock that is on another planet is having this kind of coexistence and co-experience. Well, it's not happening for bigger things, although they are proving it in the bigger world for physical objects we may be able to see, but this happens in the quantum world, right? In quantum mechanics. And so an, a particle is a point-like object, the smallest we could possibly imagine. It's mathematically derived. It's a mathematical formula. The, all of quantum mechanics is mathematics. So it's not really as though you could see it and move it into outer space, but experiments have been done. And it's not that the particle is blue. The particle has a quantum uh, property like spin. 
which I won't get into, but some quantum property where the two particles, which used to be a single particle, exhibit the same uh, characteristics when removed by space and time to a degree that defies the speed of light. Because even if you shot the particle you had in your hand out into space, it couldn't go fast enough for how quickly the particle in space is the same as the particle in your hand, even though they're separated by space and time. It's a little hard to get your, to wrap your head around. Imagine calling someone and they say, I was just thinking of you. I actually think it's related. I think that there's a foam. A friend of mine who's a physicist used that word, a quantum foam, right? And there's something called the Higgs boson field. There's all this space. Even in the molecules that make up your body, I'm sure everybody knows, the table you're looking at is not solid. That microphone, you, nothing, not all of it, you're 90% water and all of the other molecules are so, there's so much space that between here and the sun is the difference between the center of a molecule and the, other, the outside of the molecule in your body. Everything so, is me, is that? Everything, everything is me, that's right. So if there's that much space, where is all that space, right? What's in all that space? And how does quantum entanglement work? Well, maybe it's all solid. Maybe it's not, maybe it's not space. We're, we just imagine it's space because we have to measure between here and outer space. Maybe there's a foam, maybe, it's, maybe it makes things instantaneous. The truth is nobody knows why quantum entanglement works, but it's been proven. Mm. So how do we apply that to our lives? We can apply that to our lives by first of all, realizing that time is not what we think. If there are particle, if there are characteristics of particles that are changing faster than the speed of light, which is the speed limit for the universe, period. Nothing goes faster than the speed of light except quantum entangled particles. So, so much for that, right? <laughs> so, there's some, so there's already science which proves that time is not what we think. But we can use these things in our daily lives. Thinking of someone, if there's a quantum foam, thinking of someone and have them call you is a practice. I do it all the time. If I want someone to call me and they haven't called me, I imagine I go through the exercise we just did where I'm speaking to them. I'm picking up the phone. I'm looking at their name ringing on my phone. And they will say, I was just thinking of you. So is it quantum entanglement for conversations? We don't know. Again, we know that things, these things happen. We know that the quantum world exists. We know that we have these experiences. The real question is, how do we connect our daily lives using this information to lead our best possible lives, better lives of meaning and purpose and not be slaves to time? Hmm. And what about stretching time? Is there overlap there with what you're sharing about quantum entanglements or is stretching time a whole different experience? Well, you know, the, the, sci the quantum science is in the book in order to give people who are critical thinkers you know, using critical thinking, the ammunition in their own minds to start to question whether time is an arrow forever flying forward that cannot be changed. So with readers that I knew would be reading this book who believe that and who've been taught that, there had to be science in there to prove that time is not what we think. Stretching time is focused perception, what we talked about, and that is what you when you focus, your perception of time changes. Here's an example. You are reading the best possible book in the world and you're so engrossed and you started it and then you look up and you finish the whole book and you think a moment has passed and it's been two hours. Oops, you're late for the appointment. You are holding your newborn for the, for the first time. And as you hold your newborn, the world uh, falls away. You're so focused, so engrossed in the experience like Einstein and his pretty girl where you're holding them for a little period of time and you, you may think it's forever or you may think it's just a moment, right? You don't want to do thing and something and you hate it and time lasts forever. So use focus as your tool in order to change your perception of time and to stretch time, in particular using the focus perception exercise. Yeah, it's so amazing when I read that because when I was young, I did this. So when I was in my 20s and I had been just learning about metaphysics. It logically made sense to me. Let me inject a piece here. When I was in my 20s, I was late all the time. I don't know <laughs> what was up with me, but I was a chronic late person, which meant I was, I was always setting myself up for this, ah, getting places. And logically, I would think if everything is energy 
And if there's metaphysics, if we can control things, I can change the time I arrive there. Now, I'm not going to say or suggest to anybody to do this, meaning the being late part, because it really sets <laughs> you up to be uptight. Still, back then, what I would do running late is I would literally envision the time I wanted to arrive. I envision time slowing down and I would do all of this while I'm driving like a crazy child. And sure enough, almost to the late experience, I would get there on time. So I had this in my arsenal before I even (laughs) read it. And it was such a great memory that that was something I already had, that this is something all of us can do. Or I would imagine, you know, people going through a trauma have time issues, or, you know, there's a pregnancy and you don't know how it's going to long it's going to take, or you're waiting to hear back on a job interview, an apartment. And there are so many scenarios where you can probably use this technique alone so that it's really manageable in your space and you can start to influence the world around you. Right. Well, think about what you did. Instead of uh, focusing on the physical nature of the impossibility of driving across LA in 10 minutes or whatever it was, you focused on arriving on time. You changed the part of the equation you could change. Now, did you know if, that may, for, for the physical world, we don't know how it interacts yet. We don't know how we interact with the quantum field, although increasingly what is being proven in quantum mechanics is bubbling up into our big world of universes and cars and people and matter and things. With that said, by focusing on arriving, rather than letting any of the fear that you're going to be late get into your awareness, you've certainly changed the equation for how you show up in the moment. You didn't make a mistake. You didn't make a wrong turn. You simply focused on arriving on time. So number one, remove fear. Number two, focus on what you want, not what you don't want, right? Number three, we don't know how how we show up for the moment affects physical reality, although it's proven in quantum mechanics that it does. And number four, if all of that is true, practice. Mm -hmm. Practice it for your own life. Do these things for your own life and see for yourself. People call me and then they become emboldened because it worked once and they're going to take it to a bigger height. They're going to do something even more fantastic. And I say, go for it. Absolutely. Go big. Go Go big big. with time. I like it in (laughs) creation. You're a fascinating person and reading in your book, I never knew this about you. You're a jazz musician. Please tell more. What kind of instruments you play? How long have you been playing? So in that in that little girl exercise, I decided I wanted to play the saxophone when I was five, That's the six, instrument or seven. Ever, by the way. Well, it wasn't back then. It was a bit of a boyish thing. And so I and I played for a while and then I got to high school and I put that away. But in my 40s, I realized I could play an instrument. And I had a soul, meaning I'd had soul experiences. I had loved and lost and Mm -hmm. I had triumphed and I had, and I had not, and I had things to say with my soul. So I picked up the instrument again and I used these techniques to slow down playing. And in fact, I would speak to very famous jazz musicians who tell me at the height of mastery, they can pick a note out of the air. They're playing so fast that you think they can't possibly be thinking about it. And they're picking the notes out of the air one by one in their minds in slow time, in slow motion. That's mastery. So I tried to apply that to music. I was never great, but I was good enough for me. And I played on stage at Jazz at Lincoln Center a couple of times and had a band and a couple of albums. And then I'd put it away. I still have some instruments that I play. But what I noticed that, of course, Frequency and vibration are on our music because it's sound and time is a frequency and vibration, right? There are, so there are sound waves and there are uh, magnetic waves and there are, you know, waves of matter and all kinds of things and they all move over time. So we can use these techniques to do things like playing an instrument, simply slow down the field, slow down how you're playing, slow down how you're learning something or being in front of an audience. See the audience if you have to perform, loving it, enjoying it. It's a joyous occasion. Use the exercise we just did to become that. Remove all fear and you change your perception, your experience of time. May I ask you, so if you played the sax, you put the sax away and then years later, you're like, I think I'll do this again. And then you put it down and then you bring it back. I know as a musician and a singer, I 
for someone who used to play violin at a very high advanced level and let it go when she was 16, that when I pick it back up, and I do have one in my household now, I, I still remember how the hand goes. I remember how I hold the bow. There are things that is sense memory, but the rest is gone. Reading that music, knowing how to play. So are you saying that you use some of your techniques to actually get back into the groove of playing your instrument? And if so, how do you re-remember? How do you reinform yourself and even get better, excel at it? Right. So again, back to the formula, time, life, reality is one part physical and one part perception. So the physical part is the fingering of any instrument, right? Or unless you're using your voice, then your physical voice, right? Which needs to be up to a certain speed and a certain level. And you can practice with that. But then the perception, and that is play one note, just one note in slow motion and play that concentrate to the exclusion of all others using focus perception on one note one note, enjoy, luxuriate how beautiful that note is. And then maybe move on to another note and then move on pretty soon. You're putting these notes together at a high level of mastery. There's no reason to rush. There's no reason to do something for someone else. Luxuriate in the slow motion of relearning to play the instrument. See your fingers moving in slow motion do the exercise that we just did imagine playing and it's beautiful mm -hmm. and effortless and joyous and you love it you become one with the music that removes your fear that when you're playing or even practicing for yourself that you won't enjoy it you can do all of these things and they're all rooted in time mm -hmm. so you've used your life and your exercises and came up with this new piece that you alluded to earlier. You said, I'm in public safety. Don't be meditating while you're <laughs> while driving. driving. <laughs> so you created this amazing nonprofit that's called Peace to Police with the number two, peace, number two, police. Police to uh, peace. Police, the number peace, two in peace. peace. Police, police to peace. Ah, interesting. Okay, that, that came out backwards. So forgive yeah. me. So we'll make sure we give out the, the correct URL and everything for that okay. title again. How is this nonprofit related to your research with time? Can you tell us about it? And again, that's police2peace.com. Right. That is a great question. At the same time, I was, I was beginning to write down this book. I had been working in private uh, consulting for a long time and been the CEO of many, many technology companies, which was my background. And I decided that I wasn't going to do another company, work with another company that didn't give back, that wasn't socially accretive. We have a lot of problems, right, in our own backyard. And I was sort of minding my own business and I was working with a company in Florida and I was on a beach one day and on the beach came a police vehicle onto a beach on a summer afternoon with kids playing in the water and a wonderful, joyous occasion one afternoon. And I had sort of a mystical experience. I had a vision where I saw the words peace officer on a police vehicle. So I'm looking at that and it wasn't quote there, but it was there for me. But while writing this book, I realized something. And that is the only reason we care about what time it is, is, is that we care what it is that's ours to do now. If you had nothing to do, you wouldn't care what time it is. So I'm writing a book on time and I'm thinking of these questions and I'm thinking about my life. And I realized that if not me, who, if not now, when, right? I realized that if peace officer were on vehicles, it might be a way to help our communities and our police work together and live together in harmony. And this was years ago before the events of the last year. But still, even then, the, fra you know, the fractionalization, the difficulties, the police involved shootings, all of the things that we're so aware of were happening and they've been happening for the longest time, of course. And I realized that first of all, for myself, I had made space in my life and know and, and knew at the time that I, I, could, I could stumble across something that had meaning for my life because I was considering it within the framework of time. Again, with the phrase, the wonderful phrase, if not me, who, if not now, when, right? And then another phrase, which is, what is it that's mine to do? Mine to do. I had this vision and I could have picked myself up and dusted myself off and gone on like nothing happened. And a lot of us do, but I didn't do that. 
What was mine to do was to explore this vision of peace officer on vehicles. So many years later, that was 2016, 2017, Police to Peace is working around the country. We're uniting police departments and communities around programs that uplift and heal them, communities torn apart by violence, reuniting them under this concept of peace, where the community are part of the police and the police are part of the community. And how it relates to time is because I knew that I had made space in my life for this question, what is it that's mine to do now? Because I had mastered time, because I knew that self-mastery and mastering time were the same thing, and I was working on that in writing the book, I knew that this was mine to do, that I could choose to do it. And it was mine to do now, and I did. What is happening right now? What are the next steps that are happening, not necessarily that you envision, but that are concretely moving forward with the nonprofit? Oh, with Police to Peace? We're working in, in uh, cities and communities and counties around the country, introducing the idea of peace officer to police agencies, sheriffs and police agencies, so that it becomes them. So in name and in action, approaching, remember how we talked, of showing, talked about showing up for a situation? Mm -hmm. Imagine if all officers in this country showed up to every situation as a peace officer first. De-escalation, problem solving, what is the root of the problem? Instead of just following rules, which are very prescriptive and we live by in society, especially in public safety, what if there's another element? What if we came as a society to, the, to keeping the peace and guarding the people? That is going on around the country where, peace, where police agencies and sheriff's agencies are adopting peace officer. But then there's the community. The community has to buy in. Communities where harm has been done where harm needs to be acknowledged that it has been done, where the fear of harm exists, which may not have happened, but is there anyway. So we're uniting those communities with their police agencies by talking with them. We bring them together in groups and we meet and speak and share values. When people speak about values and no longer make accusations or come from places of emotion, but rather the desire for mutual understanding, that's where miracles happen. And that's our work going on around the country. Mm. So Lisa, this is Dare to Dream. What are you next Dare to Dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Well, with Police to Peace, I dream that every police agency in this country is a peace officer in name and action. If that is true, we are reunited in community. We are families. We are nurturing the systemic issues that are tearing us apart, dissolve away when everyone cares about the values of peace. So that is my dream. And also the dream of bringing this work to the world. It's time. The time jokes are uh, infinite, which is another time joke, right? So there's so many, this is the perfect timing and all the time in the world and all the time to do what we wanna do. If people really knew that and got back to their lives, they could use this book as an antidote to feeling stressed out, burned out, hopeless and unoverwhelmed. There's no reason to feel that way. You can have all the time in the world. Yeah, I say this all the time about book writing. And if people are interested in my coaching, whether it's privately or joining the group, it's like, it's time. If a book has come to you in spirit and say, said, I want to be birthed through you. I want you to author my story, so to speak. It's time. Like there's no reason to wait, right? Get yeah. on with it. We are all visionaries who came here at a really auspicious time with a piece of the puzzle to shed some light on this planet. So if you've got a message, boy, is it time to get it out there. It is, and that's the question. What is it that's mine to do now? When that book is yours to do, you can pick yourself up and go on like nothing happened. It will follow you, <laughs> it will. It'll come up again. You might as well do it now, right? When it presents itself, because it's going to come through and you can use this work and use Debbie's work to know what it is that's yours to do now mm -hmm. and bring all of your wonderful ideas through to the world as, as I was so blessed and able to do with all the time in the world. Yeah, so again, this is Lisa Broderick's book 
And uh, Lisa, where can they find it? And what would you like to tell the listeners and the watchers here at the end? <laughs> all major booksellers, of course. Amazon is a big one, but all major booksellers available now and uh, really wonderful on, uh, you know, purchase over the internet. We have bonuses on the website if you're interested. If you want to go to lisabroderick.com, that's probably the easiest. All the Time Book is the same website where you can download, uh, you can sign up for a newsletter and get bonuses and this guided meditation that we did, put that on an MP3 player and listen to it tonight, three o'clock in the morning when you wake up and, uh, you know, live a life of purpose and meaning. And we're all lead so that we can all lead our best possible lives. Thank you for the book. And thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's really been a pleasure. Debbie, thank you so much for having me. Mm. I end today's show with two pieces here. The first is, again, the URL to give out, allthetimebook.com, so you can get your copy, as well as it connects you to Lisa's site for the meditation and more. And I end today's show with this quote from Lao Tzu. Time is a created thing. To say, I don't have time, is to say, I don't want to. Subscribe to this podcast on YouTube. It's your number one transformation conversation. Go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger. Also on Apple Podcasts and all the podcast major sites. Next week on Dare to Dream, I'm having a guest return. Stephen Bassett will be back. He is a passionate voice for disclosure. Steve is back for his second interview, and he's a leading advocate for ending the 65-year government-imposed truth embargo regarding an extraterrestrial presence. His first time on the show was beyond. You want to get ready because I have all new questions for Steve Bassett. Thank you so much for joining us today on the show. Remember to dare to dream, create all your dreams. You've got a great meditation from Lisa to do it. And the question is, what is yours, what is mine to do today?